Thanks, Aaron. Uh, thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, it's also really interesting because it, it kind of um, shows the really amazing working process that we've been through and how it has been entirely text-based uh, because it's it's pothos, not pothos. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I thought I should say just mainly because uh, there are sort of plenty people uh, who who might feel strongly about that. Um, okay, so I am going to read uh, probably for about 10 minutes um, from various kind of chunks of this book. It's not a very kind of linear uh, narrative, so I'm kind of dotting around a bit in some of the various sections. Um, so don't worry if you can't keep track of what's going on. The basic gist is uh, a few years ago, my dad died. That's like the, the, the kind of baseline the thing that you need to know, I guess. Maybe you don't even need to know that. Anyway, okay, I'll start. Um, grief, a methodology. One, it refuses. Grief, a methodology 2.0. One, one vignette at a time. Two, Alexa, consummate Virgo, upon being asked how things are, says that she's so busy and exhausted she barely has time to grieve. I, consummate Sagittarius, sagely remind her that grief doesn't work like that, that it cannot be scheduled in. Three, it's not even a thing. Four, I am a liar because I have repeatedly scheduled it out. Five, the sea. Six, Chloe goes to the sea every day. I don't know whether she always thinks about her brother. Seven, Chloe walks into the sea, holding a huge ream of bubble wrap that threatens to overwhelm her, sturdy as she is in her black shift. It begins to unravel, to be whipped by the wind. Eight, Chloe gathers it in, but with each new grasp comes a new release and the bubble wrap becomes even, uh, it becomes more unwieldy than ever. It is stressful to watch. Nine, Chloe walks through a half-filled twilight, still juggling her bundle. 10, I pause the video, put my eyeball very close to the screen. Maybe it's not even bubble wrap. Moments of biblical mourning. Jesus goes to his death a certain train, a fast train through Jerusalem, and a crowd follows him in the streets of women which also bewailed and lamented him. He turns on them, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but, for, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Translation, worse things happen at sea. Women follow him in the streets, Women attend the crucifixion, go to his grave, weep, weep, weep endlessly. Mary is as lachrymose as they come, and now there's a miraculous weeping Madonna wherever you might care to find her. Modern psychology, apparently, holds that there are two kinds of grief, instrumental and intuitive. Instrumental grievers will keep busy, compartmentalize, take on new responsibilities, avoid expressions of emotion, possibly make jokes about dead dads two weeks later that will make their friends glance at each other and shift uncomfortably in their seats. Intuitive grievers rely on others, explore their feelings, express them outwardly and sincerely. They process. I should not need to add that every internet article I've read about these kinds of grief makes them gendered women, as if that were any kind of stable or coherent category, are more likely to lean intuitive, and thus women's grief is, on average, as it were, considered the more appropriate kind. Doubled down on this with Western patriarchy's discomfort with emotional men, and the cycle repeats, women telling the story of their grief over and over through the whole long universe, processing it over and over, turning it over and over, new lamentations, repeated lamentations, new tears on the statues of Mary, oil, blood, honey, all our grief made manifest in the figure of the weeping woman, Niobe, Antigone, 
Giotto's The Lamentation, Dora Ma Biting Her Nails for Picasso, Jackie Kennedy, Chris Ophelia's No Woman No Cry, Isul Ghana, Meta Dolorosa, Pieta, Pieta, Pieta. Thus says the Lord of Hosts, consider and call for the mourning women that they may come and send for the wailing women that they may come. Let them make haste and take up a wailing for us that our eyes may shed tears and our eyelids flow with water. Sorry, I'm slightly flipping through my own thing here. Okay. I dream that I am cruel to someone who is making a phone call to comfort a grieving friend. Oh, I guess I skipped a bit. The plants need watering. <laughs> I dream that I am cruel to someone who is making a phone call to, a, to comfort a grieving friend. I tell her everyone dies when she protests. We are in a huge country estate that is also maybe an Oxbridge college. In every painting, there is a cameo of Caroline Calloway that I am convinced she has painted in herself. I run around from room to room finding them and being mean to people. The comforter and I are waitresses or possibly poetry festival organizers. Either way, a huge trestle table covered in roast beef and small pickles has been set up. And as I try to apologize, the comforter becomes the griever. She asks which pool I have access to and I laugh and say something patronizing about class because she is bourgeois. Whenever I try to apologize, someone interrupts to talk about the beef. In the dream, my father is still alive, but I use his death as an excuse anyway. I tell her grief made me a bitch and I wake up in the creaking dark, still trying to justify this. I would like to say that grief makes you a narcissist, but I am writing during a pandemic and don't want to say that in these unprecedented times. So let me say that I am a narcissist and my grief is narcissistic. Do you know anything about my father yet? Memoir traditionally was supposed to be a form used to lionize the dead. Memoir was supposed to be about the subject, not the subject. My father is the void at the centre of this book. My father is the negative space in Olafur Eliasson's The Presence of Absence Pavilion 2019, which you can walk right into, taking the place of the glacial ice around which the bronze was cast. We like to put ourselves in the middle of things, to inhabit spaces made for others and consider ourselves at home. I haven't told you anything about my father yet. All I can conjure is the white of his wrist next to the perennial watch strap tan line, as if that can stand for the whole absence pre absent presence of the man. As if that strip of rarely seen flesh can say how he felt about his skin, the body he lived in. My not really godmother once told me, mortified 14, that he has really great legs, your father, for a man. I don't know if he felt that about his legs. I know that he once shaved his face clean the first year we went to Cornwall in the middle of the holiday. Only in writing this do I realize that he picked then because the only people that would see him were us. Plus holiday exuberance, what I understood it to be at the time. It was an experiment. No one liked it. But maybe he did. Maybe he had a whole relationship with his short, neat facial hair that I was never privy to. Maybe it formed part of his understanding of his selfhood the way I know it does for people who do not occupy the space farther to me. Other bodily memories. The thing he used to do with his thumb and forefinger that made a tissue paper noise. Dry skin. Shirts tucked in, t-shirts left out. The gesture of him flattening his hair down at the front. The time I bit him near his armpit while play fighting when I was four. In my head, there is an immediate huge purple welt of a bruise, which is not possible, but I still feel guilty about it. The way he blew his nose endlessly into a handkerchief and the old fashioned idiosyncrasy of it. The sound of his fingers drumming on the steering wheel and the thud of the hard pats he gave the dog. I'm trying to remember what a hug from him felt like, but it's gone already, which is awful, awful. Like trying to hold negative space to mold yourself to something fundamentally not there. Recast the bronze and the shape comes out wrong, twisted or blunted or dented in the wrong places. Too soft, too hard, reduced to tiny details. I want to list Christmas gifts, annual subscription to Wisden, Alan Johnson autobiography, slippers, 
endless cheap reading glasses in bright colours, DVD of Blackpool FC season highlights, Molten Brown Smellies, Amy MacDonald album. To list beloved objects, battered and sun-bleached loveless cafe baseball cap, glad to be grey badge, navy toweling dressing gown, have I merged it with yours? Blackpool scarf, Guggenheim Bilbao t-shirt, faintly embarrassing Barack Obama hope poster on the door of his study, cricket bat. And yet all of this is just more bronze. Melt it down, cast it again. Write about the angelic black and white photograph under my grandparents' kitchen pass, all straight fair hair and side parting and photo day scrubbed face. Write about the teenager in sandals that match his father's, clutching a brand new camera in a brown leather case on holiday in Blackpool or Torquay. Write about the young man in little white shorts and plimsolls and socks pulled up. Moss, I love this outfit. Shaggy 70s hair leaning against a wall in the sun. Something always pleasantly effeminate about my father. But I don't know these people, never did. Only ever the rounded belly version, the grayer hair, the scritchier beard. The silver ring my mother bought him on their first holiday together that he never took off. And that she now wears on her, I suppose, widow's hand. The trace it leaves, the shadow of one body moved to another. They had to resize it for her. Someone melting down the metal a bit so that what fit him now fits her. The space inside it, not quite exactly what it really was. Thanks very much, everyone, and, and thank you so much for coming. <laughs>